of this is faith. Faith. Mehr Sound and das Licht runter. so disastrous about that, nothing is in her luck ability that undermines the structure of her being. For the faith, the blind, absolute faith in whose arms he had trusted his existence, from whose mouth he sought a whispered admiration of this very possibility, that was suddenly plucked away. into another world, another sky, a richer, fuller, more embracing one. I don't think so. Good evening. My name is Armin Avanesian. I'm my f most favorite enemy. And uh, first of all, apologies for the bumpy start. Um, I, I, I could spend an hour now with all the mistakes I did today. But I'm happy uh, we're all here. You're all here. Um, and it's number 17 of my little series. We recuperate this. This evening is independent of um, um, yesterday's event, which some of you might know was a uh, an amazing seven hours reading of uh, Tom McCarthy's novel set in Ireland. Nevertheless, as yesterday had no meta level, no meta dimension, only this reading. I, I didn't have time to say thank you officially to quite a lot of people. Some of them are also here tonight. So I want to say thanks to the BNKR, for example, from Munich. Only um, Johanna is here. Uh, Ludwig is already on a plane to Tokyo. I want to say special thanks to everyone uh, at the Volksbühne, the Requisite, Yvonne is here, Bernhard Ferrari, and uh, everyone who made uh, yesterday and also tonight uh, possible. And of course, um, to Tom um, um, yeah, for, for co-hosting this or what, whatever. So um, um, today um, we have a quite conventional, so to say, setting. I thought I can, it's the first time I'm sitting here at the beginning of an evening uh, and I will sit here hopefully 
if they don't kick me uh, off the stage uh, at the end of, of the evening, uh, the conventional setting because uh, um, my guests are quite uh, extraordinary. Um, and uh, the idea is uh, yeah, to have like 40, 50 minutes of discussion and then open uh, the questions to the floor uh, to have a uh, joint discussion, uh, so to say. I'm really excited of having you here. Uh, um, and I'm not just saying this out of politeness, as hosts or moderators always say, but I think I would have never managed to get this uh, brilliant panel together only by forcing Tom somehow or tricking him into uh, doing two events here uh, and uh, helping me invite other people, some of his friends. I know his exquisite taste in intellectual uh, friends. Apart from me, uh, his taste is impeccable. Um, so uh, some nearly 10 years ago, I think I invited Tom already to the, uh, when I was still a good academic, to the Free University. But we also did an event here, I think in a cantina, though we have different memories. No, It wasn't a cantina. Um, so that was one of my, um, bargain, my, my tricks to say, like, we got to do two events again. And um, uh, he yeah, invited uh, my two guests, my two other guests here. I, I start with, with Sina Nayavi. He's the co-founder of the f uh, famous, this will become tricky this evening, like looking around, uh, of Cabinet uh, uh, Magazine, which is a kind of, like, I think the best thing one can say about it is it tries to, or doesn't just try to, it successfully manages to gap the bridge between journalistic or accessible writing and, and academic writing. That's the worst thing you can say. <laughs> the, the worst thing you can say? That uh, you didn't invite me to write yet. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty, pretty bad. Um, so um, he also does, uh, he's a curator. He's, uh, he's uh, all the things that I hate, because if, if people are doing things that are much more original and funny than me, so he does a book series where he locks in people for 24 hours and prints the result. You know, all these daring kind of uh, um, uh, funny things uh, um, I don't come up with. He was also uh, teaching at uh, Cooper Union and uh, Yale University and institutions um, um, like, like this. Maybe uh, for, for our topic, it's also important to say that one of the goals for, for, of cabinet uh, uh, is, is to, in, so to say, in times of, of uh, a lack of public intellectuals, to produce something like a public intellectual discourse or so. Um, but you can disagree later, yeah. yeah. Um, Clementine Delis, and this I have to read because I'm really worried making, making uh, mistakes. She studied contemporary art and semantic anthropology. Uh, in, in Vienna. I just realized, speaking uh, German to you, that you have my marvelous uh, proper uh, German, namely uh, Austrian accent, um, uh, in Paris and in London, and worked for many years at various international uh, places and, and institutions. I just name a few in, in France and Paris. She's a visiting professor at the École Nationale Supérieure d'Art de Paris Sergi. She's a visiting researcher at the Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art in Paris. Um, and in Germany, uh, in Frankfurt, she was for a long time uh, 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 director of the Weltkulturen uh, Museum in Frankfurt, and in, even in Berlin in 2015 at the Vico, at the uh, Wissenschaftskolleg uh, researcher. Uh, finally, Tom, uh, he also li lived in Paris. They all live in Paris, more or less, uh, in, in, in Berlin, sorry. He soon be in Berlin. Um, <laughs> um, his first like international fame or success was, was the novel um, Reminder that meanwhile also was made into a film um, by Omar Fast. Yeah, yeah, I, I come to it. Uh, it's it's <laughs> here. It's here. Uh, so, but you ruined my joke now because I wanted to uh, uh, start around. And uh, so the story of the novel is that for many years he didn't uh, uh, find a publisher. You know the the, the tragic story. Uh, and then uh, someone and now I was supposed to like look around and don't <laughs> find the name. You know, and it's Clementine de Lis who actually. Uh, um, uh, yeah, um, how, how, how was it? Published, P published it, yeah, um, and uh, um, was at the beginning of, of the success story. There's, there's other novels, fantastic novels like Sea or, or Set in Island. Um, somehow they all, one could say he's the most readable avant-gardist that, uh, that I know uh, as, a, as a writer. He's also a theory writer. He's, uh, he wrote a marvelous book on uh, Tintin. Um, he published as well in Cabinet. Oh, yeah, he did, not me, no. uh, just to mention it again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, yeah, so there's a lot of common ground uh, between, between the th three of you. If the discussion goes wrong, it can only be my fault. Um, so what I do now is just I read three uh, questions that, that we, in, in collaboration with Tom, we formulated for this event. 
um, um, that somehow build the guidelines for our discussion. Um, the first is, is the feedback loop running between radical culture and capitalism's mechanism of capture inescapable? The second is, are all avant-gardists ultimately conducting research and development for tomorrow's branding and advertising agencies? And the third one is, or is art still able to deter uh, power to open up new modes and possibilities? So as I said, that this evening is independent from yesterday, but uh, somehow in relation with the, with the novel that uh, um, uh, was read yesterday, set in Ireland, I thought that it might be best to start with asking you, Tom, to uh, answer all of these questions uh, short, briefly, uh, uh, with, with regards to, to the novel. I mean, because uh, they, they come out of the novel. We, could, we, we should discuss them maybe like with regards to the novel and then uh, get more general. Okay, well, let me just say a couple of things about the novel. First, though, also I'd like to say thank you to everyone at Volkspuna, everyone at Bunker, um, to Armen, it's a real honor to be here, and, and, and also to my two fellow guests. I mean, w when I lived in New York, by far the most interesting place there was well, not just uh, Cabinet Magazine, but the Cabinet Magazine project space. It was uh, hosted an amazing series of, of, of very original events, and... Um, Cena was responsible for all that, so his New York's loss is, is Berlin's gain, most definitely. Um, Clementine is, is, is a, you know, a legend um, about whom I don't need to say much that you don't already know. I mean, I, I personally owe her an enormous debt of gratitude for first publishing Remainder, and indeed for um, uh, inviting me on a residency when she was the director of the Weltkulturen Museum in Frankfurt, um, out of which a whole chapter of Satin Island came, and, and more, really, more than just that chapter. But I'll just say a couple of words about the book, um, for those of you that don't know. Um, it's hero, anti-hero, you, the letter U. I use that thinking of Musil's Ulrich, you know, the man ohne Eigenschaft, the man with no qualities, but this is like a contracted version. Instead of 2,000 pages, it's 100, and instead of Ulrich, it's you. So and it's finished. It's, it's Your book is finished. Minimalist, super yeah. minimalist, <laughs> super short. Um, so he's, a, he's a trained as an anthropologist, but like a majority of anthropology graduates, I think, um, he works in the corporate sector. sector. He works for a, a consultancy which um, kind of uses uh, anthropological and general avant-garde um, you know, left field, radical, philosophical kind of theory, Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, Gilles Deleuze, uh, Adorno, Badiou, etc., and puts it in the service of corporations, government think tanks, and so on. This is not something I invented. This happens every day. Um, there are many companies doing exactly this. And what interests me about this situation is, 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 as Armin hinted, this kind of feedback loop, we could call it, between um, cultural radicalism and um, capitalism systems of, of, of recuperation. And, and recuperation is a term that, you know, that, that comes from, from Debord, from the situationists, which they use to, Debor uses to describe exactly this kind of process. And no, no matter anything that might threaten the system can be reabsorbed by it and turned to its advantage. So this is not something new. I mean, the, the surrealists' um, experiments become the language of advertising. I mean, so quickly that some of them were even working for advertisers. You know, the cut-ups of William Burroughs and Brian Geisen become MTV and, and advertising again. The, um, the theories of Deleuze, are, as, as, as Sina maybe will talk about later, are used by military um, forces to, to, to devise strategies for occupation and, and, and so on. So I'm kind of very interested in this, uh, the ethical and political kind of compromise situation of, of the artist. And, and I guess anthropology is really interesting in that respect. My, my hero is not a writer, he's an anthropologist, which is kind of a writer, but, but the idea of anthropology is that you look at a culture from outside it, the classical idea, you go and look at a tribe, you observe them, and then you come back to Europe and you write the book, which is a kind of almost like a 
cartoon um, version of, of the model for the 19th century novelist. Whether that actually ever worked is another, is another discussion. But, but in the 20th century, in anthropology, of course, this has collapsed since Lévi-Strauss, since uh, Michel de Certeau and so on. You know, we are the natives, we are the tribe. You don't go to the, to the jungle, you, you, you move through the streets of Paris. There is a complete collapse between field and home. The very idea of writing the report becomes more and more unthinkable when anyhow the report has already been written by software. You know, Facebook is tabulating our, our networks of kinship. You don't need an anthropologist or a novelist for that. So, so I kind of, I guess I used the figure of the anthropologist to kind of explore these, these patterns of, of appropriation, recuperation, um, and exploitation, I guess. And um, I should stop there, because I didn't really come up with any answers. I just tried to pose the question. As, um, as you were talking about the anthropologist, um, um, Clementine, maybe you, you uh, I remember you like even saying that, that Tom I is an anthropologist in, in, in a way. So it's not just, not just this you, the protagonist of, of the novel, but like the, 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 the writer or the novelist uh, himself. Is, is an anthropologist. Does, does it make sense? Or is this a metaphor that gets like to lose, uh, you know, in the end and everyone is, everyone who's like get, getting lost in a city in a Benjaminian or the Bordian way? Well, or can we give a more no, well precision? No, I, I think it's interesting. You made me think now that you mentioned the word avant-garde. Uh, so for me, it's, I get thrown back to the 1930s. Readable avant-garde. He's the most readable avant-garde. Uh, okay, the mo but nevertheless, um, there are. Um, the, usually, you have anthropologists who are desperately trying to recognize the literary tropes within the structure of the ethnography. You get people, the famous '80s meta-anthropologists like James Clifford, who are who take apart apart the construction of an ethnography, which is done here in loneliness rather than in a group, with a group of people looking over your shoulder. And you don't often get a literary person, a novelist, writing a kind of, dare I say, fake ethnography. And there was, I mean, not fake in the sense that it's not true what you're writing, but it isn't, hasn't come out of field work as it would with an anthropologist. And there was a guy like that in the 1930s who was a friend of Bataille and Man Ray he was called William Seabrook, and he constructed the most wild novels, uh, Adventures in Arabia, Amongst the Pygmies, this kind of thing, completely fabricated with photographs. And um, he was a, a journalist, right, who was making a buck out of the kind of interest in exoticism in the 19, late 1920s, 1930s. But what, um, what is interesting about you is that he also carries with him a period in time. You, you, the protagonist of Saturn Island. And he's a copywriter, an anthropologist. He's in some, he's a curator, right? He, he jumps into a mass of information and he wants to pull out the nugget in order to sell it via his other protagonist, Payman. And Payman is looking for connectedness, something that you talk about a lot in your work. You always come back to the notion of um, connectedness. So your, your anthropologist is what I would probably call an anthropologist. He's between the mass the, of getting caught in something that he can't control, including, in this case, the big report, right? Which is this macabre version of, of the book that you're going to write, as in Malarmé, but that you never get to write. Uh, the problem that you can never interpret the other. Uh, you'll fail always to the point of death. And um, I think that, uh, that what happens then with, with anthropology and with writing, and you have that obviously with a kind of exoticism of the avant-garde, is that you have different temporalities. Yeah? The anthropologist, uh, you could say there's been a kind of anthropometric time, a time which is uh, Darwinian, evolutionary, um, taxonomic, you're interested in taxonomies, classificatory, 
And then you have another time that kind of gets kind of comes out of this early ev evolutionary anthropology, and that's the so-called ethnographic present, where you s you write in a way that that makes you feel that everything that you're reading is happening now, but obviously it isn't, because you tinge it with the right patina. And then you might have a remediatory time, yeah? a time which asks for a different kind of perception and a different kind of interpretation of what you see. And that's, in a way, closer to what you're trying to look for, I think, with, with you. You're trying to question, maybe, if there is a remediation that's possible out of the process of appropriation, recuperation, fast, you know, ejection, manipulation, all of these kinds of things. So that, that maybe is one element that happens in, in, your, in your writing. And the last thing, maybe, that I want to say about the anthropology thing, which is very interesting, which you do in Remainder and you do in Saturn Island, you do it in another novel called Sea, and it's highly anthropological, and that is to attempt synchronous description. So, you know, there's somebody over at the bar, there's somebody in the toilets, there's somebody outside watching the Volksbühne, there's another one who's taking notes in the front row, and if you follow someone like Marcel Griol, a military aviator who became an anthropologist, who believed you could track the indigenous mind by hanging off a cliff and then looking at a village below, right? Uh, and obviously, in order to govern a people, you had to know them. So this was all part of the, the military side to anthropology. Um, so this synchronous uh, condition in your writing comes up again and again. If those of you who have read Remainder will remember that this man, this man who is, uh, like you, obsessed with things falling from the sky, he is constantly reenacting a series of situations from a woman frying liver to another guy playing a piano to a hold up, a bank heist, and he does it again and again, and you write it from all those different perspectives, that kind of panopticism, but ground level. Yeah. And I think that's, that's um, I mean, some, maybe later we can come back to that, but it's a question of how you convey the contemporary. What is it to convey the contemporary? Is it the individual romanticism of the rugged adventurer, the anthropologist who goes out and has this intimate and complex and Malinovskian relationship to somebody who maybe can't, cannot even write in their minds, the minds of the anthropologist? Or is it accompaniment, teamwork? Is it a, a condition that can only be perceived through the combined vision and interpretation of people uh, in, in a, uh, working towards a common uh, or a collective interest. Or a collective profit. <laughs> or a collective profit, exactly, yeah. And is Payman a prophet? That's what you were saying the other day. You pointed out true? to me, because uh, Payman ha has, has is kind of Persian Egypt. heritage. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a Persian name. I thought it meant promise, but you pointed yeah. out it also has its promise in the sense of prophecy. Can you explain the role of Payman? Yeah, Payman Oh, sorry, Payman is the boss and founder of the company. He's the kind of brilliant visionary of connectivity. I, I just pieced together yeah. all his lines from either Rem Koolhaas, Saha Hadid, <laughs> or, uh, or Guy Debord, basically. <laughs> Everything he says is plagiarized yeah. from one of those three. Right? Um, since we're going to talk about temporality, and that's really, I think, one of the hearts of the book, um, there was a section in the book that it talks about buffering. I don't know how many people have read the book, which I thought was really a fantastic moment. I have to say, as I read the book, I felt more and more the kind of oil spill that the book takes to be a metaphor of some kind, and you're never quite sure what it is in a very nice way. It's never, it just spills and comes and goes um, to fill myself up. So whereas by the end of the novel, I felt choked myself, and I didn't feel quite like the aesthetic object that you promised I would be once oil covers me. Um, but. To go back to that section where you talk about buffering, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit. So the section in buffering happens when he's looking at a computer screen and the time between the video he's watching and the buffered zone becomes less and less until the buffering is happening at the exact same time as the video he's watching. There is no buffer anymore. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So and so the experience circle. and the recollection of the experience become 
both simultaneous and impossible as a result of that. Um, and I thought that maybe we should ask you a little bit about two sections about Levi Strauss in the book that I want to, and for myself, have a little bit of a closer read of. One is a section about Levi Strauss that happens at the beginning of the book where you talk about the sense of nostalgia um, that the anthropologist has, especially in Truce Tropique, where he shows up um, at a particular, with a particular tribe, say, and he feels that if only he'd been there 50 years earlier, he could have seen certain things and been able to understand the social totality somehow differently and perhaps more purely, I'm not quite sure if that's the right word, than he, Levi Strauss, has access to now. But he knows full well that somebody coming 50 years down the line will also have the same feeling about his own, ex Claude Levi Strauss's own experience, feeling if only he had come 50 years earlier. And he knows there's an in infinite, I think, deferral of this sense that if only I had come earlier, there would have been a moment when the totality would have been available to me. There's that. And then there's another section about Levi Strauss, um, also from Truce Tropique, which has a slightly different axis, I think, um, and you'll have to remind me if this is right, um, where the question is really about um, the familiar and the unfamiliar, yeah, and whether if one of the jobs of anthropology is to take the particular and look for the generic in order to understand structures. So anything that's individual, specific, finally has to be laid aside if it can't be absorbed, or hopefully be absorbed, I guess, into the generic. Um, and then there's the question of the familiar and the unfamiliar. And the, 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 the desire, as it were, for the unfamiliar somehow to stay, mm -hmm. even though the anthropologist desires to make everything familiar, to make it banal, because in those banalities is where structure lies, not in the singular weird episode, or fucking weird as you call it, I think, at one point. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the temporality of those two particular moments in Levi Strauss. Yeah, sure. I mean, the whole book starts with this kind of invocation of Hamlet and things being out of joint, out of sync. Everything is out of sync with everything else. You know, when you look at the screen and it's buffering and you realize, you know, when you're on Skype, that temporality is wrong. The person's face is frozen, but the words are still coming. You know, things are just out of sync. And, and, and Levi Strauss is brilliant about, as, as you've just said, about talking about this kind of temporality being wrong. We're either too late, or, or but then the next put is always too late. And then he realizes that what the anthropologist really desires, the only thing that creates desire in the anthropologist when they look at a culture is a state where the frames of comprehension are lacking. Once those frames are there, you've got it, you've done that culture, and it's boring. It loses its mystique. Mm -hmm. And then and there's a wonderful episode where he visits a tribe who don't know what writing is and he's got his pens and his pads, and the tribe's chief takes his pen and kind of scribbles to make his subjects think that he, the chief, knows writing and that they don't, and that he's, you know, to, el to maintain his elevated status. And Levi Strauss realizes, this is what I'm doing, not just with my readers, but with myself. I'm creating moments, not of comprehension, but of incomprehension, a kind of time lag where they don't understand yet, or where I don't understand yet, what is to be understood. It's almost like a form of masturbation. I mean, this con con continual production of one's own desire by creating that kind of gap of, of delay. And then, of course, this is what Payman, the boss, is doing. He's not selling knowledge to corporations. He's selling uncertainty. He's, se he's monetizing the gaps where knowledge has not yet established itself. Mm. Rem Coolhouse is very explicit about this, this is what he's doing. I mean, he says, I'm, I'm not selling knowledge, I'm selling uncertainty, ambiguity, and monetizing that. And I, and, and I think that's a logic that opens up kind of around the act of writing. So writing produces that, that kind of, you know, Derridian deferral or difference or whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it, in which things are all not quite aligned mm -hmm. and, and, and that itself is, is less subversive than it is kind of perversely mm -hmm. monetizable within late capitalism. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> capitalism is all about delay, right? You don't, you don't buy the pig. You, 
from the farmer. You buy the interest on the future value of the pig set off against the future value of the hen, which is da, 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 da. It's all about deferral and delay and gaps. Mm -hmm. um, payment says at one point um, that, or, or the, the novel says about payment, or payment himself says, um, what the company produces is fiction, mm. right? Uh, it's fictions that then become like real. Um, so now we, we have somehow the three topics of, of tonight somehow. Um, um, the, the economic element, the company, the anthropology and, and, and literature. And all of them are mediated, all of them are structured temporarily in, in, a, in a certain way. Now, now you, uh, uh, Clementine, you, you said that there are two different uh, per personalities. Um, um, one, uh, I would call the kind, a kind of presentification mm -hmm. of everything becoming like present. Um, and, and the other one is the remediation. Now, uh, in terms of like f literature or, or literary theory, I would say these are two modes of like on the one hand fiction, but the way it's used in German, you know, fiction as a, as a kind of state of Im uh, being immersed in, in a text, for example. Uh, and the other one is uh, narrativity, n narrating. So isn't, I mean, this, this, we're talking here about ideology and we're talking about like ideological, uh, uh, fictional ideologies that, that nevertheless are very powerful and forceful and, and become real. Isn't, isn't that also the problem of, of, of literature uh, in itself? I mean, as we, we're talking about the avant-garde. So there was a time of the avant-garde when the novel was like that, or it was in the sense of this is corrupt. Uh, we won't write novels anymore because we, uh, narrating, producing a certain chronology, um, producing fiction, narrating a coherent story was, was exactly what, what was not um, allowed somehow for, for political uh, reasons. So I don't know, I throw that at you now, uh, this kind of reproach uh, on, on all three levels, because we, we try to combine the, the, the anthropological, the, the economical, and the, uh, the, the, yeah, the literary one. Or the I mean, I began by speaking about Seabrook, who I, I wrote about years and years ago, but I, 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 <laughs> I still have his books, but I haven't reread them. But the phantom, phantasmagorical is very, very important in the way that, uh, like this, this piece of whatever you think it might be, is the object that Tom McCarthy selected from um, a depot of 70,000 objects. This was the one we exhibited. Um, it's about the size of whatever it is that you can imagine that it might be. Uh, no, it's small. It's very small, very condensed. And it's a little bit like, uh, it's actually rubber, caoutchouc. Um, but it's like a condensed version of the oil spill. It's like the conden condensed kind of version of the fresh kills. So if you read Saturn Island at the end, it turns into Staten Island. And the fresh kills is the most extraordinary I don't know if this is answering your question, but it's what I'm thinking of now, okay? So forgive me for the, the diatribe. But uh, the phantasmagorical in writing in science, in the scientism of anthropology, uh, is only possible when you have a lot of unauthored, non-allocated uh, elements. So in a landfill, You've got hundreds of bits of bodies, of objects, of paper, of plastic, of shit, yeah? In an ethnographic museum, the defining crime of anthropology was to bring back all these objects and not to take the time to name the person who made it, right? So for the phantasmagorical anthropologist or the phantasmagorical scientist, it's a, it's a huge reservoir. It's a reservoir that allows you to construct everything a posteriori, yeah? not in the field. So when you're talking about Tristropique, or if you talk about Malinowski's um, the, uh, diaries, or if you speak about L'Afrique Fantôme, which only just came out in English, which was written in 1933, for Michel Leris's major work, uh, and Paul Rabinow, who you, you work with in Saturn Island, Paul Rabinow's 1973 Reflections on Fieldwork in Morocco. These are the rare, rare moments when you can read an anthropologist questioning themselves, laying it down, 
talking about sex, talking about the problems they have of the objects being looted from different people's homes or, or shrines. And the rest of it is pure and utter fucking fantasy, right? So the question is, the landfill, the fresh kills, the, the, this uh, oil spill, uh, and I'm, ne I'm not quite clear in your book, the relationship between the dynamic of the oil spill, yeah, which moves and keeps you know, coming back and is recursive, but it's there, it's flowing. And the notion of Saturn Island itself, of this idea of a reservoir of compression, of you speak of compound man, you speak of collective man, yeah? you come back constantly to this kind of amalgamation of, of materia, of matter, and this is very, very close to the uh, highly problematic situation that we find ourselves in, even in Germany today, which is to have these reservoirs of triggers for phantasmagorical imaginations and not to know how to use them anymore, i.e. the reserves of ethnographic collections. Is this yeah? a problem of narrative or a problem of ownership or...? Ah, it's a very interesting question. It's a, it's a problem of trying to find a post-avant-garde way of understanding how to write about things that one doesn't know about or understand. So it's a, it's a question, it's, you know, it's a banal to try and find words to uh, fill the gaps, like migration, yeah? It doesn't make any sense. The fact of the matter is that we have material here that needs to be open to new semantic interpretations that are non-exclusive. And the exclusivity of anthropology is its downfall. Yeah. Yeah. But what really struck me visiting your museum was, was the history of that acquisition and the fact that the anthropology, you think of anthropologists as pure scientists who are separate from the dirty world of trade and everything. And of course, this is absolutely untrue. The anthropology missions were funded by the good burgers of Frankfurt in the 1890s and through to the 1960s. 1960s. Exactly. I mean, they were, they were, they were the avant-garde. They were going out and making a first reading of the tribe, and of course, looting objects, material mm. culture, but also interpreting so that the oil companies and the logging companies knew how to get purchase, get traction on the tribe, and you know. Um, exploit their land and put them into indentured labor and so on. So, so, so I think it's interesting that, you know, anthropology as an avant-garde is already a form of writing that is, I its interpretation is just serving up the world to, to power, you know, which is why this rubber so interests me because the whole museum is full of objects labeled, but this is an object whose just messiness seems to resist any kind, it hasn't really got a form. They've put string around it to try and give it a form, but it's, what, what, spilling one, out what, one last thing that I, I don't want to forget, and that is that the, uh, it's really interesting to follow a kind of a, a trail, not just from the avant-garde of the 1930s or Lévi-Strauss, but a little bit later. And for example, I tried to find out in Frankfurt whether the anthropolo Anthropology Museum had helped to harbor the Bader-Meinhof group. How did the anthropologist, who should be open-minded, uh, democratically interested people, uh, you know, this is what you expect, did they provide a safe haven at any point for... Did they? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, this particular object reminds me, so, um, for people who don't know Fresh Kills, Fresh Kills is a part of Staten Island where for many, many decades all the garbage of New York was thrown on there and thrown on there and thrown on there and then it was finally closed shortly before 9-11. And then it was opened on right after 9-11 because they had to have a place to dump bits of the building and bits of the bodies. And it was opened again, and stuff was dumped there. And then after a while, the families of the people who died in 9-11 said that they want the bodies back. So they had to sift through all the stuff to try and find bits and pieces of bodies all over again. So that's a very special history that has attached itself recently, but it's also an extraordinary site. As Tom mentions, it's, it's visible from outer space along with the wall of China, and it's, they're doing all these things with it now. But one of the kinds of forms of anthropology that it has invited is fundamentally different than these kinds of anthropology that we're talking about, and has a very different kind of temporality and a very different mode of acquisition, if you like, because that place of garbage, um, fundamental to your book in some sense, 
is a place where garbage was dumped on a daily basis, tons and tons of it right on top of each other, compacting it anaerobically. And so about, I think, 15 years ago, I'd have to check my days, a guy called William Rathje, who's a, an anthropologist of garbage, decided to do this crazy experiment. Do you, do you guys know, do you know Rathje's work? No. He did core samples into the garbage. I mean, this goes down hundreds of feet now. He did core samples as if you were on the you know, Arctic Pole, pulling out entire core samples, decades and decades of garbage, just like this. And because it's anaerobic, a lot of the stuff is still more or less intact. Like you can see the steak, you can see the this, you can see the that. So it's a whole history of the detritus of New York and all the, if you like the, I mean, you called it, you called it detritus, detritus at the end of the book, a kind of remainder, all the stuff that couldn't be digested in some form by this great city is all there. And it's a core sample. And its acquisition is fundamentally different than these other modes of, um, of um, anthropology. Um, and I don't know, I think it's nice to think about the two of them together next to each other, you know. Levi Strauss in Africa and Rathji just drilling down in Staten Island yeah. and pulling out all this stuff. There's a really, in, another interesting passage in Levi Strauss is, is where he, he talks about, um, as you travel around the world, you see the, he says for the tribe who is, with whom the anthropologist makes first contact, this is a catastrophe. It, it's invariably, it leads to their ruin, that because soon the missionaries and then the, com the oil companies will come, they're gonna get diseases, they're gonna mm. lose their culture, it's, it's a catastrophe. And, and, and by the end of his career, he's saying, when you travel around the world, the first thing you see, the first thing Western man sees is his own filth thrown in mankind's face. The West is a, is a laboratory spewing out a toxic, um, excess garbage there's and, and a, a beautiful section in satin island um from one of the, one of the characters in the book who we never really quite get to understand why he's around but he's like a container it's a man who's dying of cancer and at one point he's being told that he has to shoot up jaffa orange juice because it will help him and iodine and various things and the protagonist you goes to see him for the last time. And he gets very upset because the hospital windows are dirty. And he just thinks, what, how can they be looking after my friend properly if they don't even clean the windows? And he goes away and then he, he doesn't go back to see him anymore. He dies, the man dies, Petra. But then he understands that actually the filth on the window is the stuff of the world. Yeah? Black is matter. the black stuff, is the black matter. So you have different versions in your work of this black opacity, of mm. this kind of gunge, yeah. that is also a gunge that we are also creating, yeah. that even the literary figure creates. Well, the ultimate thing that the black matter is, whether it's oil or cancer, or it is ink. I mean, it's, right. it's ink. You know, when, right. when he watches the oil spill and he sees the oil hitting the snow, of the pristine Arctic coastline. He sees ink polluting paper, you but know, you, words you say, staining. You the say writing is pollution. Yeah, it's a form of toxic. Yeah. I'm just really interested in the idea of, of toxicity, you know, which I think is interesting. <laughs> Sina was pointing out while well, we had dinner before that recuperation, of course, has a medical sense, a kind of recovery from intoxication or, you know, and, and, and the idea that writing might not be the thing that cures us, but is, is the disease as well. I, I, you know, that's another kind of feedback loop, mm. the, the pharmacon, that <laughs> the medicine that kills. Mm. I, I, I don't know, I don't know how, how you think of toxicity in relation to, you know. Let's just stay on that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, uh, all right, you don't want to keep Use your Oh, sorry, that's fine. Um, no, we'll come back, because I'm going to okay. say something. Toxicity in with this kind of stuff is clear, yeah? We, I mean, this is discussed. It's something that I keep repeating, but I, for those of you who don't know it, a lot of the access to ethnographic collections at the moment is being uh, obfuscated or prevented because of claims of toxicity. In other words, that the millions of objects that are in the reserve collections 
or the collections, the depots here in Germany, are uh, contaminated in or contaminatable in two ways. The first is that when objects were brought back from, in quotes, the jungle, they might have contained all kinds of bugs, all kinds of bugs. So they were, in the Brit case of the British Museum, they were, uh, or the Museum of Mankind, they were placed on the roof and sprayed with arsenic right down into the 80s, okay? So now if, um, as happened in Dalem, the Kogi people come over specially to see the couple of masks that are in the collection, and they were told in the end that they couldn't see them because these objects are toxic, <laughs> that they could, if you put this object between us, instead of, uh, as Hammonds was, David Hammonds would say, instead of you know, triggering off a conversation, it's actually going to poison us. That's one level. That's the bureaucratic level, the administrative level. The second level is much more curious, and that is that it's, and I know this because I work with Frederick Keck, who is a, pan, um, a, zone, a zoonosis specialist, so he works on pandemics based, uh, carried by bugs and animals, mm -hmm. you know, bird flu, avian flu, this kind of stuff. And so, as the director of research at the Musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac, he uh, is responsible for developing postdoctoral research around the collections. So he, as a zoonosis specialist, has started investigating the question of human remains in these objects and whether they actually contain a certain microbiome that if it was given the chance could unleash new pandemics, pandemics of the kind that we haven't seen for several hundred years. And this is the other area of to toxicity, which is to say these objects are potentially dangerous because they contain DNA, microbiome, whether it's you know, in the human remains and the hair and the nails and the whatever, the skin that is on so much of this material. Yeah. But what I find really interesting about that is the kind of the way it transfers to a kind of psychoanalytic model of uh, melancholia as a kind of, um, you know, Freud describes it as, as this buried thing that bursts back forth through the skin and, 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 infects the entire psyche, and that's political too, right? Hamlet as a melancholic is making the, the political un unconscious, the unspoken of a society, the crimes, you know, burst back through the, through the it's almost like the rubbish erupting back through the, the fresh kill site has become a nature reserve, mm -hmm. nature. It basically means a layer, <laughs> an inch of turf over, uh, you know, 200 meters of crime. <laughs> and, and I love that. You know, melancholia is a political reaction against, against um, maybe that's a form of, you know, re reaction against is recuperation. Toxicity, you know. Is toxicity, for example, speaking like through the eyes of your anthropologist, toxicity is culturally specific? I'm asking you. Mm. Well, it's connected. I mean, the Europeans stole it from the Papua New Guineans. Um, it's in a European, it's the dirty secret of the, of the European archive, which another thing when I visited your collection, the first thing that, ex your ex-collection, was the first thing you enter the building, which is like a sarcophagus around Chernobyl, it's made of thick concrete, it, you, your, your nose is assailed by disinfectant. It's like they're trying to clean, 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 <laughs> you know. Um, but, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's like, I guess it is cultural. It has a cultural archaeology, which I guess moves away from, um, moves towards the, the, the developed world and, and its mechanisms of narrating, right? I mean. And just as a very quick... Um, Side recently, the National Ice Core. Oh, sorry, the National Ice Core Laboratory in the U.S., which is an amazing archive of ice core samples from North and South Pole. They have too much of this stuff, and so for the right people, they're willing to let you have sections of them. And we managed to get a chunk of this stuff recently. And they said you could do a lot of different things with it. This ice was frozen. 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years ago. Here's a chunk that they sent us in a frozen special like FedEx bag. And they said, why don't you guys make drinks with them? You know? And <laughs> as we were preparing to do this, a friend of mine who's a historian of science said, 
one of the things in this water, of course, is that there are all kinds of toxicities that we have not seen, all kinds of bacteria, all kinds of new, like old forms frozen in there we have not seen for a long, long time. And um, we unleashed them one night. We, <laughs> <laughs> we drank them, we unleashed them, and off they went into the... So the toxicities that we're talking about can also be you know, resuscitated from so long ago and placed into circulation at this right. point in ways that you know, are just impossible to imagine. We can't imagine the end point of these things. You know? this, is, this is something else that fascinates me about the oil spill. It is a form of archive. I mean, what yes, oil is, right. is basically dinosaurs that's and right. trees from yeah. 10 million years ago. So yeah. when you see oil spill, this is the archive of the planet that's kind right. of coming to the, to the surface. I mean, There's that amazing piece where it's section where you talk about this archive coming out. First, you talk about how scientists should be playing it like a record, like vinyl, putting a, putting a needle on the grooves and trying to understand what that means, which I thought was an amazing section. And then in one of the great set pieces of the novel, there is a sense that this archive coming back is not a disaster. This archive coming back is I don't know how you would put it. It's, it's poetic. It's, it's like poetic. Hamlet's ghost. It's the return yeah. of the repressed. It's the yeah. stuff of, of great yeah. fiction. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Frankenstein's monster. And the ecological coming. disaster that these oil spills have produced, in some sense, are read. And then you're accused of aestheticizing it by somebody at the conference. And you kind of have a retort to them, which is perhaps, I don't know if you want to talk about that. but. Um, well, the idea that tragedy itself is, is already an aesthetic, you know, right. to call something yeah. a tragedy is, yeah. is basically Greek, you know, it's totally yeah. theatrical. And <laughs> I mean, th this is aesthetics. Yeah. Everything is, is aesthetics. Mm. It's all aesthetics. Which begs the question, like, why do we need writers, right? If aesthetics is happening at the mineral level of melting ice and, or, or garbage and oil, and if, if writing is happening at the data level of notation mm. an algorithm you know what what, what are you doing what are you doing yeah <laughs> <laughs> no really i mean what what, what use is the right maybe we can use that as a as a last round before we open the floor these are two very um different temporalities that what what they share is that they're inhuman temporalities like one one is the mineral one and the, the algorithm one is like mm. the past and one is yeah. the temporality mm. um, of the future. And that would be my question, but there isn't a kind of inherent limitation in, in these different like fields of, of research or research fields or, or um, field researchers or however you call it, bit of, of uh, anthropology um, and, 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 and literature or fiction. And basically even with regards to the novel, one could say it's also a kind of very 20th century model of, of economics, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a derivative economy uh, that, that we have today that is really independent of these desire structures that you described uh, uh, as typical for, for capitalism. So the, the question uh, would be a bit like, isn't, isn't the novel, like all good novels, they are novels since Joyce that to end all novels, right? So your novel is a bit telling the story of, um, um, novels not making sense anymore. So it starts the kind of the, the, this report needs to be written. You know the the the, the big report, the große report. Yesterday I heard it in Lachricht. German. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Lachricht. and so it's a kind of research for this this another German word, the Universalgelehrte. You know this general knowledge, this Leibniz 2.0 or so. Um, and and uh, towards the end of the novel, uh, there's a kind of like um, the knowledge somehow sinks in that this is no longer possible but then it doesn't need this 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 uh, uh, universal man is not needed anymore because everything is written down anyhow uh, the problem is it's machines writing it's algorithms writing it's software writing um, and the product is something that can only be read also by another software by another machine so in, in that sense like what about anthropology and novels uh, um, uh, anymore right i mean the, the it's a novel to end all novels, so what we learn is like this should be your last, last <laughs> novel, uh, which I know it isn't, so I can uh, fairly... I would go even it. further than Joyce. Cervantes is about how the novel doesn't work anymore, and it's kind of the first novel. I mean, the good novels are always that is about the, the yeah. impossibility of the novel, which, is, which makes it a kind of unique cultural form, perhaps. Maybe art is about art not working. Maybe anthropology, too. But, but the, the, to come back again to Levi Strauss, the most beautiful bit in Tristropique for me 
is when he describes being in, in a jungle and he's stuck and he's got another three months until the boat is going to come and he's bored and he's drunk all his wine and he's smoked all his cigarettes and he's bored and he's going out of his head. And he thinks, oh, fuck this. I'm going to write a great play. Screw anthropology. I'm going to become a great dramatist. And he starts writing this epic drama in the style of Racine or Corneille about kings and empires and da-da-da-da-da. And he writes it on the back of his research notes. So he's got all these notes, six months' worth of notes about tribal structures, village layout, diagrams, vocabulary, kinship, economy, blah, blah, blah. And he turns the paper over, and he starts writing his epic play. And of course, he gives up after one week. He, <laughs> he gets bored of that, too. But I imagine like, if you took that paper, if you took that piece of paper under a microscope and you blew it up, Right? On one side, you've got science as the kind of possible universal knowledge system, which doesn't really work because it's not proper science. It's French, you know, structuralist bullshit. You know? <laughs> and on the other side, you've got epic art, which doesn't work because it's bullshit too, and this is not the 18th or the 16th century, and, and he doesn't even finish it. But in the middle, between those two sides of the paper, paper is actually three-dimensional, right? I mean, you've got this pulp of dead trees and dead whatever paper's made out of, gunk. You know, this pulpy no-man's land, which is neither one nor the other, it's the interval between the two. And, and maybe that would be the space of literature, right? I mean, yeah? That's, what's this? Hartes on, oh no, this bit. The end of, oh my God, the cat. Yeah. What do you make of that? He ends Tristropy by talking about his cat. Can you read it out? Or like the last bit? You okay. Know, the last Farewell to savages then. Farewell to journeying. And instead, during the brief intervals in which humanity can bear to interrupt its hive-like labors, let us grasp the effort, essence of what our species has been and still is beyond thought and beneath society an essence that may be vouchsafed to us in a mineral more beautiful than any work of man, in the scent more subtly evolved than our books that lingers in the heart of a lily or in the wink of an eye, heavy with patience, serenity, and mutual forgiveness that sometimes through an involuntary understanding one can exchange with a cat the end. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> do, how, do you understand yeah. that, Sina? Why yeah, did well, you copy that piece? I have a cat, so I do. But, um, I do have a cat, so I do understand it a little bit. But this, the thing that you and I looked at when we looked at this a little earlier was this line, beyond thought and beneath society. And for a structuralist, whose structures, you know, are supposed to gather every nook and cranny, there is no remainder in structuralism, unlike post-structuralism then this is kind of a weird thing to end your piece on, right? I mean, beyond thought and beneath society, there's something, and the cat's eyes will show that thing to you a little bit sometimes when you look right at the cat. It's an amazing thing. So it's just like the territory of the inhuman. It's not even the post-human, it's like yeah. the inhuman, the, the inhuman resistance and to... And something that resists his own theory. I mean, his melancholia here is... Um, finds some place, at least to, it finds harbor here, if not finally a solution, I think. So the cat is the final thing that can't be recuperated. <laughs> but then the cat ends <laughs> up on, on YouTube, <laughs> doing, doing mm. backflips endlessly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still think that somehow, if you don't mind me saying, I think this obsession, and there are many obsessions with you in your writing, uh, maybe we don't have time to go into the obsessions now, but one of them is Lévi-Strauss. And if you think about it, the majority of his work, his interest in what you call the codex, uh, the, the, the cognitive side to his analyses, um, they've actually found a way further ahead. And if you think about what is the, the next mutation of anthropology, what is it? It's informatics. It's informatics. Informatics is in the service of the military, like anthropology was. Anthropology, the handmaiden of colonialism. Gouverner un peuple, c'est déjà le connaître. 
Marcel Griol. Uh, it's about observation, surveillance, analysis, and conversion. Yeah? So it doesn't have the, it's more prosaic, if you like, than the avant-gardist, um, odd, subjective writing that they once wrote and never again. Yeah? You have to understand that if you focus on tristropique, you're not talking about his kinship structures. Yeah? It's, and, and so that's where the, if, you dare, if I dare say it, there's a kind of a romanticism in this analogy, which is fine. Yeah? Um, but uh, I think sometimes that what you're actually trying to do with you and use interest in uh, the contemporary, the anthropology of the contemporary, not contemporary anthropology, so his uh, present tense anthropology, is much more in line with uh, the writing, say, of Paul Ravenel, who is absolutely not a structuralist. Yeah, absolutely not. And so the question which I think you wanted to come to at the end of these kind of, I think you wanted to talk about great big ideas to do with today. And that's where I think this issue, the cynicism that might operate around, a, you know, uh, the exploitation, recuperation of observation of other peoples uh, has to be kind of reconsidered in a way, remediated if you like, because it's ailing, it's deficient in terms of an idea of the construction of alliances today and what does it, does it, is it writing, is it observing, is it uh, dealing with matter, is it producing architecture, uh, is it producing uh, new kinds of archaeology like landfill archaeology. So I, I wonder maybe, you know, um, I, but I'm definitely clear for myself that the the mutation of anthropology, social anthropology, uh, even if it does medical anthropology, political anth gender anthropology, etc., and the museums are completely by the wayside, <laughs> unfortunately, that the next version of it has been informatics, or is informatics. It's your department, though, isn't it? That's what you work on, those things. In the novel, the present tense is impossible. He's always trying for a moment of nowness, and he never gets it. There is no now. As soon as you say now, it's not now. Ingeborg Bachmann writes about this beautifully. She says the only person who can say now is the suicide, which is impossible, because, of course, the suicide can't speak once they're suicided. Um, Which is why the Great Report is, is death. Yeah, well, the it's Great death. Report would be kind you of can't. death, but then it's unwritable. Yeah. But Paul Rabinow, who you mentioned, he has a brilliant, he makes a brilliant point in his book, which I stole, I mean, I, I took word for word and put it in my character's mouth, um, where he points out that the word epoch originally had an astronomical meaning. It meant the point, the moving point in space from which you observe another moving point in space, right? The planet from which you observe a meteorite or the spaceship from which, you know, this is going back to Galileo. It had an astronomical, not a historical sense. So he says, what we need is not contemporary anthropology, it's an anthropology of the contemporary, about kind of moving relational intervals. That's the only way that temporality can be thought. And, may, you know, that's the task of anthropology and, and I think Fiction. I hate that word, fiction, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm. Because you wouldn't be here, like in the audience, I would start like arguing about this, but like <laughs> I 
Thank you. Coming back uh, to the matter of matter, please, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, materiality in your novel and your work in general. Is materiality, um, or how do you deal with the concept of materiality as a negation or a eradication of meaning or the human ascriptions to uh, materiality? Or rather, is materiality a fundamental substance? And I think your discussion here uh, leaned toward this um, second option, a fundamental substance full of potential meaning, a negation or full of potential meaning, and this potential meaning prone to, as you said, involuntary understanding. Second question, is this a contradiction? Yeah, uh, yes to all. I mean, so when I was like, 21 or something, I was reading Georges Bataille and I copied out this brilliant line where he defines matter. You know, his, his whole Bataille is always thinking about matter and base materialism, but I only found one place where he tries to define what matter is. And he says, I can only define it as the non-logical difference that represents in relation to the economy of the universe what crime represents in relation to the law. Right, so matter is a crime against the economy of the universe, against the categorization system. This is why I love this. This is like a crime against the archive because it's not an object. It's not a headrest or a totem or a cooking pot. It's just matter, you know, and it demands interpretation, but it resists it at the same time. And I think this is the essence of Poetry, you know, you read Francis Ponge, he just looks at dumb objects like an orange or a cigarette or an oyster. He tries to describe them and fails. And it's not just that he fails, it's that language just implodes. You know, metaphysics implodes. In th th these are the prose poems, short prose poems of, of um, Francis Ponge. You know, metaphysics implodes in front of these basic objects but th that still demand that, that you try and write it, but that metaphysics attend to them. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, so matter is everything and, and yet excessive and... No, I, I think it's a, it's a separate question. I mean, the no, on, on the American edition of Saturn Island, on the front cover, it says a confession crossed out, a manifesto crossed out, a memoir crossed out, and then a novel not crossed out, and then something else crossed out, a report. treatise, report crossed out. So it's not like the novel is the thing that it is. It's just no, the it's thing it exactly least exactly. isn't. Do you know what I mean? The novel is, it's like back to the pulpy middle of the paper. Also, it's almost like an Ulipo thing. It's like, it's ridiculous to write a novel. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like, you know, that American critic says it's like dressing in a clown suit to drive your car. Like, why? You know, <laughs> to have a character, to have a, but, but in a way, the constraint itself is kind of liberating. I mean, it's, you accept this constraint and then even though it's ridiculous, you can work within it. And uh, I don't know, it just, it's, it's a way of doing something. But I recognize that similar ideas could be dealt with and are being dealt with by visual art and philosophy and anthropology and so on. Um, I just, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm related to that, or I guess about this book. If it is, then you presumably are talking about an enigmatic and the great report being a, a kind of metaphor also for um, what has been in the news so much recently, which was Facebook. Data, big data accumulation, and that sort of story that is not really um, legible. It's not a novel, but it's uh, but it's a, a more data than has ever been available. It's more information. It's more. Uh, um, it is a, 
form of truth that is no longer measurable to humans. And it, uh, in, in that sense, I think it relates to this idea of the novel which is maybe seen as throwback form, or also this sort of look back that Arnold is talking about. So, I mean, I guess my question for you is like, how do you think your work does or should or could relate to the sort of current political debate? I, I, I think I think it, that kind of technological data situation that you're describing gets to a point where it's it's no longer a question of technology. It's it's a theological question. <laughs> I was looking at these, you know, Trevor Pagelin's beautiful photographs from his helicopter of the NSA black giant black box, which contains all the information in the world, but no one can read it. And then cutting to images of the Kaaba in Mecca, which looks almost identical, another black box, which is Godhead, which is infinity, which is incomprehensible, no matter how many books we write. Um, and I, you know, there's this um, 16th century English poet, James Herbert, who writes, you know, God's word is all, if we could spell, <laughs> you know. It's all there, but but we can't read it. I mean, the, the, it becomes it's beyond politics. It's it's pure pure theology, and I think that situation of buffering is again a theological situation. You know, you're you're on your computer, whatever. You're trying to buy an airline ticket or something, and the connection goes and it buffers, and suddenly you imagine there are angels, data angels, dancing all around your modem who are taking care of you. Don't worry, we're gonna, we've are gonna. we got your back. There is a system, there but are. But Tom, Tom, you, know. you write, you write but buffering. But Can I quote yeah. you? Buffering, the skeleton laid bare of time or memory itself. Yeah, waiting in anxiety, a delay where, where God is not there yet. <laughs> and the parachute is not attached. And the, the circle is just a circle. Right? I mean, it's a very theological novel too, right? Yeah. In some sense, the y the yet is very much part of it. I think. Yeah. I mean. Put it nearer your mic. <laughs> it is a very theological <laughs> novel. And, I mean, do you agree that there is a? Yeah. S yeah. The cargo cults, cargo cults figure in it. You know, Vanuatu's yeah. waiting for the planes to come, <laughs> as as we wait for God. Or t t to reappear, but it's a theological novel in the same sense that Nietzsche is a theological thinker. I mean, it, yeah. there is we are there is no I'm an atheist, you know? yeah. but that's that's still a theological position. Right. We're we're so facing up to the abyss, yeah. you know, to the absence of God or of whatever metaphysics. You know. But let's face it. I mean, everywhere in your novels, things are falling down from heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether it's cats falling off the edges of window sills or. Uh, parachutists doing Russian roulette with yeah. parachutes or uh, the man in remainder who in the end kind of just runs out of petrol and drops yeah. or had something drop on him which is why he started the reenactments yeah. shares Anyways. falling shares yeah. falling yeah, yeah. everything falling down gravity gravity is matter too yeah. There is no other question to be answered as to raise profits. What would you say about this? I, I, I don't quite understand the, the question. So, like, profit is everything, so... So there's no other question to be answered by anthropologists. So they work in advertising agencies. Because that is a, it is a, everything there is left. It's not true. <laughs> not all here for profit necessarily. Yeah. It's also quite opaque as a science. You know, you never really know what an anthropologist does after they've done their PhD. You really don't, you know. Their PhDs are anyway totally uh, heterogeneous. So uh, it's a non-career oriented uh, discipline. Remember there used to be those things <laughs> that you studied that didn't bring you to any money or anything, and that's what anthropology so, is really so about. 
I mean, art used to be, now it's just business, but like, so is philosophy or literary theory or like, I mean, in, with that respect, like all u humanities, right? Uh, uh, including anthropology are a bit like that. But this is important. I mean, this is why this corporate anthropologist for me is a stand-in for the novelist because, I mean, as a, you know, we have a 19th century version of the poet who's in, in the garret, separate from the world, doesn't need money, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I just reject this. I mean, I think as a writer, of course, I'm within the world. I'm within capital. You, you are writing a book. You have a publisher. They pay you money. You know, they sell the book. The publisher is owned by a bigger corporation, which is owned by a bigger corporation, oh, which is owned by that's Rupert that's Murdoch. That's and that's, that's, the more <laughs> you know. that's a more so complicated situation that all is money. I yeah. Mean, but everything, there is no outside to the machine. No, you know, you're within, and I think political agency begins with realizing you yeah. are inside Absolutely. and you have agency because you're inside, not and because you're outside. it was a fantastically outside. liberating uh, moment for writers in the 18th century where they left patronage and came into capitalism and it was like a fantastic <laughs> thing for them. But you didn't write this just for money. No, but. Did you? No, but money <laughs> enabled yeah, me to yeah. write it. Yeah, yeah. But the. It was just the formulation there felt to me that it needs to be more complicated than it's all money or something. I, I can't remember how you said it. I was, I was quite uh, kind of referring to the concept of, of Mark Fisher, capitalist realism, that there is no outside. Yeah. And there is sure. no future anymore. Yeah. What, is what, what he said. Yeah. So all we are doing is retro stuff and working to, to raise money for ourselves or for companies I mean, the thing that there is no future, I think how it needs to be understood is like the future is closed. There's a kind of identification of the future present and the, and the present future. What we imagine now as the future, you know, is the present is governed from the future. Uh, the, the in that sense, there is no present and there is no future because the, the present is governed from somewhere else. And that is the fundamental problem maybe with anthropology or philosophy or, or whatever, that we always look into the past, right? Uh, but this kind of expertise doesn't help us anymore in, in like, if I understand you correctly, um, in this capitalist realism where, where there is no future in the sense of um, there is no, the future has no, is nothing open anymore. But in a way, I'm kind of uninterested in the future. I'm interested in the, in the radical possibilities of, of the archive and, and uh, y you know, progress is such a, um, 18th century narrative, this idea of linear, you know, temporalities are, are more complex. They, they loop around, they're, they're in a feedback loop too, they're subject to delays. I mean, the angel of history faces backwards, right? I mean, this is where, you know, memory, the, these kind of things, the symptom, snagging, tripping, interrupting, intervals, these kind of things are possible and, and maybe this is something the artist of any type, writer, visual artist, whatever, can plug into and exacerbate. And this is, somehow it, it, it excites me. It's not about making money or, uh, you know, or producing knowledge. It's about creating kind of spaces and temporalities that are somehow exciting. It's curious, actually, that if you talk about the radical, a radical approach to the archive, that um, in my, my impression at the moment is that there's a a quite a lot of artists different to maybe in the 90s, where there was this kind of ethnographic turn that Hal Foster speaks about, kind of very banal in my opinion, but at the moment there's a lot of subjective historiography going on. Artists taking over the, the difficulty of dealing with archives that are part of the estrangement of citizens during the 20th century, maybe in contexts of, of communism, socialism, uh, where the the question of retrieving, in this case, recuperating rather than remediating the last breath of the generation that signifies the 20th century, because that generation is petering out fast. One, every day, there are many, many people who lived through the post-World War I. I mean, you know, you can only live, what, I, I know, so and so long. But the, in certain parts of the world, these people have seen a lot of different models of ideology, of 
social living, of capitalism, of literature, of in influx, and it's artists today and m m subjective working curators who are actually capturing this. It isn't anthropologists. Yeah? Uh, so then it throws up the big question, and you, come, you, you said you talked about archives, and, and that is, what is with all this stuff? Yeah, what is with all this matter, this materiality? Do we just bury it? Do we bury it? Or do we remediate it? Yeah, that's a big question. Do we restitute? Do we close the doors and say this stuff is toxic? We don't need it. You can't have it because you don't have a museum that's good enough for it. Because we know what conservation is and we know how long these objects should live for. And we have the experts. That's why we're going to build the right kind of structure for it. Or do we open the doors and start remediating, which is what we did here in Frankfurt, right? You and I, I have to, to say that if you read, and, yeah. if you read Satin Island, you'll come to chapter 9.1, etc. And I have to say it now, this is not me. <laughs> this Claudia person is a diabolic, <laughs> diabolic kind of uh, amalgamation of effectively the person who made it possible for me to have to leave. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> bits of it are me, not the dirty gloves. For those of you who have read Satin Island. No, but I think that's, what, that's why I'm so happy to be talking with both of you, because I think that's precisely what, what you both are doing in your films, is, is this kind of remediation. You're putting things back into play in a way that kind of breaks open the casket you know, um, lets out the zombies to, you know, um, to, to cross infect and pollinate, germinate new strains of, of cultural and that has no relationship to the future? No. Yeah, it does. It opens up, it opens up, um, it opens up a field of possibility. It opens up a plane. This is like Mackenzie Walk, what Mackenzie Walk says, you know, a hack. It's got nothing to do with computers or whatever. It's about connecting two things that shouldn't be connected, that are meant to be in different sealed caskets, so that a new plane is produced on which the event might happen. What is the event? Don't know. Yep. But we don't want to know. Just let, let that possibility be made, and I think that's what you're both doing. There's one more question. Is it, is it the last question? Yeah. Uh, maybe the right moment to ask the question has already passed, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I want to go back to the what you call the theological situation, because I was uh, very intrigued uh, by the notion of Babel and uh, Babel also being the label of the of the company, and uh, and also maybe in connection to the Madison episode in the in the novel, because I I thought that Babel is also is not only the situation of language confusion, but it's also the time before Christ is going to come back as the Messiah and solving all the problems. It's the time of human sacrifice. And I wanted to ask you how the Babel um, motive is related to the Madison episode, because when all these protesters are gathered, this is a scene of extreme violence. This is... Um, a scene of where they, in the end, babble and sing the song. So maybe you can say a little bit of uh, about that and maybe at, about the end of the novel that yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I leave it to that. Thanks. So, so yeah, that's great. I mean, babbling. What did you say? Were you here yesterday? No, I wasn't. I guess we talked about it. <laughs> no, um, yeah, so in the Madison episode, the, the narrator has this girlfriend who, it turns out she was at the Genoa protests in 2001, which really happened uh, where, where many protesters went to Genoa to protest against G8, and the Italian police treated them with absolute brutality. And it wasn't really reported for another eight, nine years because September the 11th happened days later, and so you know the news was full of that. Um, and in this scene, Madison is kind of this, this, this 
it's basically in a torture situation where she's taken into this room with a man who gives her an electric shock and then makes her kind of reenact certain postures from classical paintings and it's almost like the archive of the West just running itself through and then he's got this radio or something machine that's sending in instructions from somewhere else and and I was kind of thinking, I was thinking of Kafka and of Saad, obviously, and of David Lynch, especially. And in, so in, in Lynch and, and Kafka, what they have in common is wherever, wherever you think the headquarters is, the room, the room where, it, where all the power comes from, it's not the room, it's the antechamber to the corridor, to the other room, to the other room, where there's a telephone, to a network, to another network, right? So Madison has this kind of 1960s or 1980s version of politics where she thinks, if I could only get to the room, then I would see power in all its evil totality. I would, you know, it's like in Star Wars where like if you can get that bomb into that one little ventilator shaft, the whole Death Star will explode. <laughs> Whereas in reality, it, it doesn't work like that. The room is not the room. It's just, it's just a node in a network. Power is a network. So, so it's a kind of naive politics of, of location coming up against a more the reality of 21st century network culture. Um, and then at the end, she goes to take her plane back to London from Turin and thinks of Nietzsche going mad in Ch Torino. You know, it's, it's that moment of the parachute again and realizing there is no, you know, there is no um, punctum, there is no one place against which we could pit our political kind of agency. It's about network navigation. It's much more complicated than we thought. And he's um, telling about failing all the time because he's a part of the observation. And for me, the boy was a kind of a feedback of the pollution, the human did all the pollution. And it's all about the reflection how do you, um, how to say, um, he wants to have an explanation for some um, observations, but at the end, the oil, like the pollution, is. Uh, everywhere and someone has to bring up a new uh, observation and investigation and this is the end of the um, questioning and because it's impossible to to answer who we are because we are part of the uh, and even with the two you know you mentioned the um, um, scientific um, uh, experiment with the two atoms Yes, and so it's all about cat. this also. So you don't know, and it's uh, the intention of the atom. Yeah. So it's all about intentions and uh, observation. Uh, yes, yeah. so, yeah. And payment for me, it was someone who understood this, and it was, and, and he knew it's not, he cannot have an answer of anything. And so, yeah, I don't know if I catch this. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's exactly right. You, you, you cannot write the great report. The great reports cannot be written. You cannot observe from the outside because there is no outside and so on. But his final gesture, even after the failure of all that, he comes to the end of the island and beyond is just pure light, which is death, which is suburbia, which is nothing. And he turns back and he goes back into the machine. He goes back into the city. I, I just basically stole the end of um, Balzac, the... Gorio, Le Père Gorio, where he does the same. He goes back into Paris. And I think that's, it's like positive. I mean, he's going back into the machine. He's a bug. He's like an insect. He's a glitch. You know, <laughs> he's like the, the bug operator going back into the machinery to 
infect it with anxiety and unrest. And that's, that's resistance and, and art, maybe. I, I think it's a very good thing he does at the end. He lives to fight another day. <laughs> so the question is not writing the report, it's to carry on occupying the network and glitching, glitching it maybe, buffering. <laughs> Thanks a lot to uh, the three of you, uh, Simon, Dean, Sina, and uh, of course Tom. Um, before um, you know, leave, I have to advertise the next event because it's also if you're interested really in a philosophical thinker on time and all levels, right? Philosophical time, minimum time, ontological time, the octoseconds in uh, physical time, then do come on the first of. Sorry again for the delay, but like for a comment past event and buffering, uh, mm -hmm. Charlie wanted